Okay, you guys ready? You guys ready? Who's ready? You guys ready? Who's ready? I have the announcement for the next challenge. I don't know if you guys are ready for this. It's going to be a Halloween challenge. It's going to be due on the 31st of Halloween. And what it's going to be is a challenge that is based on the circus of the absurd. It's not an actual circus, so please don't draw circus performers, unless you want to draw circus performers. But the challenge, and I have officially announced it today, so feel free to get started after today's class, is about being as creative as possible. All right? So welcome to this month's character design challenge. The character design theme will be centered on absurdity and creativity. The task is to design a uniquely whimsical character based off this theme. This challenge will be focused on channeling creativity and will be critiqued based on creativity more than technical execution. So usually I'm there talking, talking to you about light and stuff like that. And I'll talk a little bit about light. Of course, we still want our paintings to look good. We don't throw sciences out the window. But this, this, this challenge is meant to encourage your inner, your, 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 your creativity. If, you, if you're having this, you know, writer's block or artist's block right now, and you don't know what to draw, this challenge should be able to, to kind of work as a catalyst to push you into realizing you do have actually great ideas and you just have to give it some time uh, and some effort to, to really discover and explore what your imagination can combine with, you know, what your imagination can create for you. Um, so this, this, this challenge is not to design the abstract and irrational, so it's not just drawing floating pigs with seven faces, uh, but it is to design a character using abstractions channeled through the costume design, weapon or item design, facial expressions, or any other window of characterization. It has to be a functional design for a functional character, but completely drowning in absurdity and creativity. If you want to, I don't even know at the top, because this is how hard it is to be creative. I can't just throw some stuff on the top of my head, but if you want to draw like a, you know, a, a female warrior with, with, with car parts for armor and a, a pet pig that has lock, rocket launcher legs, you can go ahead and do that. But it has to be wonderfully Halloween-y and wonderfully absurd and creative and just the more praise that we give is, is, is just based on how creative and how much you pushed your imagination and pushed the ridiculous and combined the ridiculous with the absurd and created this, this massive circus of character design, um, you know, this, this parade of madness. Uh, so that's, that's, what's, what, that's what it's all about for, for this challenge. And it's going to be this month and October. And it'll be due on the 31st. Uh, luckily, the 31st is on a Tuesday, so I'll be critiquing Halloween. Ooh. <laughs> on, on the Tuesday, the 31st, okay? Um, so, I invite the quirky, I invite the surreal, the macabre, the, the ridiculous. I invite you to stretch your minds as far as creatively possible. Remember to channel your inner mad hatter and that no idea is too wild or silly. However, you are not allowed to draw porn, smut, or weird, gory shit. Uh, remember to channel, I mean, however, this is not a challenge to solely design abstractions or realism, but to use them as a, as, as, a way to dress your character and tell the story. It's not just about drawing abstract art or drawing data art or drawing realism or modernist art or something too impressionist. It's about drawing and designing a character. This is a character design challenge and it is it is about the absurdity and designing a character that's supposed to be mad. So imagine me as a game designer. I have no artistic skill whatsoever and <laughs> I have a feeling someone is going <laughs> to get that sound bite <laughs> just to rack and miss she has no artistic skill whatsoever so imagine me as a, as a commissioner and I have no artistic skill and I am assigning you to design these characters for me and I, the, the point of the game is that you are a bunch of children trapped in a circus and you're were you know put together by this crazy evil guy and then I don't know whatever it could be a puppet it could be like a weird ragdoll character with with um Spaghetti hair. I don't know. <laughs> it just has to be wonderfully absurd. Um, and uh, remember the word functional, though. Uh, so it's not about drawing random, random, random shit. It's not going to be random. Functional is the key word here. Um, and meaning that the character can walk, the character can act, the character can talk. Functional character design. Functional character means a character that's playable in a game. Um, it can't be a 
a weird ball jumping around like Kirby or something. It has to be a real character. Um, whether or not this character is half creature, half, that's all up to you. That's part of the whimsy. That's part of the madness. All right. Um, so the final submission must be fully rendered image uh, in color. Um, the background can be a gray white value. Please, please remember to have enough breathing room for all poles of the canvas. You can't just have a wide canvas with a short top. Uh, you may cast shadows on the floor beneath the character. As, as always, the common thread between these challenges is to put you in a workplace environment where your art and design skills are tested and limited by design requirements. Uh, of course, designing a character is not just in painting a face and a figure, but throwing in some costumes. It's a matter of relating to the character's backstories and pulling inspiration from their story from for the entire design. Your character design does not have to be for the protagonist. It can be used to personify evil or the antagonist of a narrative. Uh, please remember that you are supposed to include gesture drawings. Um, I want to see gestures. Uh, so I'm just going to, before I post this up on the thing, I'm just going to give myself a quick little note to remind myself uh, to, to be very, very specific on the kind of gestures I expect out of you guys. Um, remember the design is very dependent on the backstory, so spend some time ruminating. It could be circus performers. I mean, it could be. It's whatever you want it to be. But the point is that, you know, imagine them all as characters meeting on the uh, Mad Hatter's tea table. Um, so, you know, they're all coming for tea. And it's just from all corners, all poles of, of the world of madness. You can bring in fantasy. You can bring in a witch with a, with that, 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 that flies on a pen instead of a broomstick. It could be Halloween themed as well. You could draw Dracula. But Dracula as a hairdresser who has a big pair of scissors. I don't know. It's just going to be wonderfully fun to do, and I think that um, it's going to help us all channel our inner intrigue and our inner storyteller um, and our imagination and our childlike imagination, stuff that only children come up with. So, so like a snake with 50 arms, and each arm has a different kind of weapon, but the snake is a robot. You know, something, something weird, something like you've never seen before. Um, some stuff that I would reference as great for, you know, a show that helps you kind of see what it means to tap into your childlike imagination. Adventure Time is a wonderful show to look at. Uh, just to take a look at that in the first couple episodes is fine. Uh, if you're a show, like a fan of the show, that's good, so you know already what I'm talking about. It's just a wonderful show to go into um, to, to get some inspiration. Uh, there is inspiration to be found everywhere, but remember, it's a matter of combining stuff. So com combinations is what I'm going to be looking at. So unique combination is what I'm going to be looking at. So I'll write that down as well. All right, so what do I mean by unique combination? It could be character is f so far-fetched, and what they do is so far-fetched, and what they're holding and what they're wearing is also just as far-fetched. So nothing matches, um, and it's not supposed to. Uh, okay, so I hope this is fun. It can be creepy and morbid. Yeah, like I said, the macabre. It can, it can be creepy and mor morbid. It can be cow zombies. Um, absolutely, that. the movie Labyrinth is a really, really good good uh, piece of inspiration right there with David Bowie. Uh, so if you want to um, comment all your suggestions for stuff that's inspirational, once I post this on the community wall, so this is the community right here. Oh, to get to the community, just go to estabrac.com and click the... Okay, class is over, guys. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, Google Plus icon and uh, just join here. I'll pin this challenge at the top of the, of the community wall and make sure that you are um, replying uh, to, the, to the post so that you can suggest uh, what you think is whimsical, what people should look at, um, what you suggest, questions about the challenge, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Basically, you can't draw a picture frame that has legs. You can't. But if it's a guy wearing a picture frame costume, sorry, that was my spoon, um, then that's good. That's really fun. Uh, spoons, all right, spoons. It could be a, a little mouse warrior with a spoon sword, and he has big boots that are too big for him, and his boots go all the way up to his, his they're basically, basically pant boots. And he could have really, really funny Victorian style um, clothing or something like that. Or Renaissance style, like that really frilly, frilly uh, scarf they used to wear. Um, it could be something like that, Madness. But it just can't be something too weird, too abstract. It can't be melting clocks. It can't be uh, Dali style. It can't be Mucha. It can't be too much of anything. But it can be a very early Mucha or a very early Dali, okay? All right, so 
Um, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna just, I think I covered everything here. Just let me take a look at my notes. I think I covered everything. All right, <clears throat> so I invite you to get started. Uh, post, make sure that you're posting more than one sketch to the community. You are not allowed to post one single sketch. I expect to see work handed in with these. I expect to see the full illustration and the same post on the due date on Halloween. I expect you to post your Halloween. <laughs> I expect you to post um, all the sketches, all the planning sketches, all the gesture stuff, all the mood board. You can set up a mood board, get all kinds of inspirational photographs. I usually post inspirational folder and reference folder for these challenges, but because it just seems so antithetical for me to post references and restrictions for a challenge that's supposed to be you exploring your creative power. Um, so that's why I suggest you do watch those crazy movies and those funny movies and watch Mad Max and then right after that watch some Disney and just see what you can combine. Um, but, um, but like, you know, I don't want you to think that it is uh, any requirement. The only requirement is that it's a functional character. So I really want you to explore your inner, inner, inner creator, your inner madman. All right. Your inner Guillermo del Toro. Exactly. Um, I mean, I mean, he's not that whimsical. I don't know. I wouldn't put him on a pedestal, is all I'm saying. <clears throat> all right, so let's get started. Um, this piece right here, it's very beautiful. Um, I like what you're doing. I like how you're not painting some typical pretty pretty boy. But I feel like some of the pretty boy is still here. Um, so your efforts are wonderful, but um, some of the color choices and the values here are a little bit off, as well as the facial expressions. So let me move into this liquefy if it if it decides to work <clears throat> so it has to be a creature human not an inanimate object exactly so you know what I'm just gonna keep writing these answers that I have in eminence at object um, and as you guys just make sure that I have cleared it up and make sure that I'm as clear as possible with this challenge even though it's a mad challenge and it's just all the madness so what I'm doing right now is I'm bringing in some asymmetry in the expression. And when I'm sculpting on ZBrush, this is exactly what I do. I get just that warp tool or that move tool, and I just start throwing off the symmetry. When we're sculpting characters like this, what we do usually is depend too much on the symmetry. We think symmetry is something we can't break on an ugly face. If you're painting an ogre, you are painting something that's supposed to look scary. You're painting something that's supposed to look ugly. Now, we're not talking about protagonist ogres like in World of Warcraft movie. Those were beautiful designs, and they all had very, very proportionate, beautiful faces. Um, but the point is that when we're designing characters like this, we want to break all the beauty standards. So that means eyes get really, really close together. And the, the character just gets so fucking ugly as soon as we do that. Um, we make the head, which is more brawn than brain kind of silhouette, so we make the pin head happen just a little bit squared little jar head uh, silhouette. I'm also going to enlarge the horns because they look kind of funny, really, really tiny. So you see how I, how, what I mean when I said you were painting a pretty face still. You were still working off these beauty standards and you need to learn how to just completely nip those in the bud when a commissioner comes in and tells you, hey, I want an ugly ogre. I want something that looks scary. I want something that it looks like it's scary to fight. Maybe you're fighting a boss. Maybe you're you're designing some sort of bad guy or a minion. You don't want them to look like you know the hot one. You want them to look like mean, ugly minions who have a really bad attitude problem. So you want to bring in expression there, as well. If you are going for a dumb minion, you kind of just flop the ears. If you are going for a, a very, you know, very ugly, scary-looking minion, you shrink the eyes. Um, nearly completely before, you know, until they just kind of, if they get any smaller, the character won't have eyes kind of thing. Or they'll get too small for, for comfort. And then you want to hook the nose as much as possible. You want to stay away from that baby nose where the nostrils are visible upward. Or you want to just completely give him the pig nose and extend that size. But nothing, nothing beautiful. Always working with the extremes when you're designing a scary looking ogre. just like that so you can go ahead and do that this is the kind of stuff you explore when you sculpt it's really really fun it's really wonderful and I really recommend it to all of you guys just ZBrush just go in and try your try your hardest to just break all the beauty standards also it's sculpting is just a wonderful way to reintroduce the form and uh, the, the sculpture and the volume of an object back into your 2d world 
when they get back into ca into the canvas. I'll probably have to edit that by hand. All right, so now it's looking more like an ogre. I'm going to flop his ears just a little bit just to show he's a dumb idiot. He's the leader of the pack, but he's an idiot as well. And do you see how important it is to think about narrative? Kind of exactly what role he's playing in the story. You don't do much unless you, you think about all this stuff. There's really not much you can channel unless you're thinking about the narrative. And I hope this challenge coming up kind of helps you guys, you know, discover your inner writer and just discover what what, what it is to um, make something interesting, make something read just with just with the visuals. And you have all that writing behind. You don't have, you can't say he was an ugly guy and let the character, or let the reader decide that he's ugly. This is not how it works in, 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 in visual art. We have to show how ugly he is, and we can't expect the viewer to continue the rest. All right? So he's very handsome before. Just you get rid of his uh, horns and get rid of his uh, tusks, and he looks kind of just like a normal, really pissed off skinhead. <laughs> um, so what you want to do is just kind of break all of that. You also want to mess around with this as well. I, I love to mess around with this just to show how unusually ugly he is. And you're designing a character that's supposed to be scary. You're not supposed to be making him look appealing. In the narrative, he's the bad guy. In the narrative, he wants to kill and rape and pillage. You, you don't want to make him look sexy, all right? Unless you, I don't know, you're into that or something. Or you're writing Fifty Shades of Grey or some shit like that. Ah, the trailer for the next one is already out. Ugh. I never thought I'd hate Valentine's Day so much. All right, so I'm just going to edit some more of these things. Maybe have giving him a funny little bust, like, uh, what are they called? Butt butts? I don't know. Butts? For, is it a butt? Yeah. Yeah. Bunt? No. I don't know. Weird little little stub little damn it what's the word it's also t uh, trunk i don't know it just is it's just cut off it broke all right so now what i'm doing is i'm just carrying some of these values all the way to the edge and now we're going to talk about your value choice um so not only do you still have your lines but you don't have any defined light source nearby what is it what is, bunt bust what is it <clears throat> Troll, ogre, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's all interchangeable. Nubs. Thank you, Tom. Nubs. <laughs> I'm sorry. English is not my first language. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. Like, I don't know the words for. Like, a lot. You'd be surprised. I mean, you guys know how much I mess up sayings. Like, kill two birds with one shoe or something like that. Alright, so what I'm going to do now is start casting some shadows. He has really, really strong brow bones so that means we're casting shadows all the way down and i am kind of just uh starting to build up light dark light dark patterns so this brow bone carries all the way it doesn't just completely indent he doesn't have that typical glabella that comes with like you know basic human face or skeletal structure remember that when you're designing a creature it's a new anatomy creatures mean new anatomy write that back to me and that means that you are no longer permitted to uh, find the human equivalent of it. You're going to have to look at some references. You're going to have to look at some skeletal references of deformed humans, maybe, um, or skeletal references of like, a, like a, a warthog and then one of a bird and just see how you can combine them and how you can make sense of this new creature. His skin seems to just suddenly drop value outside here, so I'm just going to defuse all of this. And all of this here should not be as dark as the dark spot. So yeah, he has these wrinkles, but these wrinkles don't even come close to how dark his nostrils are. The cast shadow doesn't come close to how dark his nostrils are. And I think that was one of the biggest issues you had was because um, you, you were using black everywhere and you were saying, okay, well, it's an ogre. I'm allowed to kind of just make him look a little messy, but you're throwing off the believability here. Um, another thing I'm going to do to make him look a little bit more scary is I'm going to show more of the white of the eyes. So maybe he has no chill. Maybe he is just constantly, you know, big eyed. E either he's awake or he's asleep. Like either he's alert or he's asleep. 
Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do. At least one of the eyes I have to make look uncomfortable. He kind of looks like a bad guy that eventually learned to be good, but he's still ugly kind of thing. So I'm going to try to make his eyes look a little bit more scary. Also, what you don't want to do for a character that's supposed to be scary, that's supposed to be an antagonist, you're not supposed to be, um, giving them big pupils or big iris. Uh, those are, those are, that's a mistake right there when you do that. Here, let me just repaint this entirely. All right, so you're supposed to give them a tiny little eye, just like that. Look at how much attitude he has now compared to where he was before. So if I was a game designer and I wanted to scare the poop out of my players, this is exactly what I would do. I would ask the commissioner, hey, I mean, I would ask the artist, hey, please make them as scary as possible. I mean, we only have so much to work with. He's on screen for two seconds, and it's a 10-minute boss fight. Um, so I really want this character to stand out. This is just the start of, you know, or maybe the final boss, and I really want it to, to read from a distance. All right, so what I'm going to do next is start differentiating parts of the anatomy from each other. So your the tusks have weird little colors, and I'm going to go ahead and grayscale them completely. They are made from a different matter. They shouldn't have to be green as well. They can be as gray as as, as uh, like you know pure grayscale. And then I'm going to desaturate any color in the shadows because that's not where colors go. And I'm going to leave the major greens for the what? Who knows where the best colors go? Where do the best colors go? Anyone? I'm also going to correct um, this over here. Maybe give him, I'm going to start blocking in. Maybe give him like a really strong uh, Cupid's bow. Not that Cupid has anything to do with this poor guy's life. Cupid can't help this. All right, and then I'm going to get color and get into the pale blues. Mid-tones, exactly, good, the mid-tones. So I'm gonna grayscale pretty much everywhere except for the mid-tones. And the reason why I'm doing that is because um, the whites are too light and they're gonna be reflecting some kind of shiny nearby light source and the darks are just too dark for any of the yellow in the green to be to ever come through so we end up getting more blue and that means we just grayscale so what we do the only thing we have left are the midtones where the green can really come out and it won't even be that that green that yellow a green remember we have yellow green or we have blue green it'll be more of a blue green so i'm going to just choose from the from the kind of the far side of the green and this is the kind of green I'm going to choose. It's going to be right over here, really desaturated, but still generally very saturated compared to the rest of the face. And that's what I'm going to bring in. Opacity is all the way down. And I'm just bringing it in to the... I'm going to desaturate one more time. Right over here. It's enough color. And I'm going to bring it right into the mid-tones. This is going to be all the green we need. I'm going to use it around the nose. This is the equivalent of blush. And then I'm going to get that yellow light. So that yellow white light color is the color of the light source. And that's what we use anywhere where we have some shine to give him the sense that he is actually part of a light environment. Let me get the lasso back. that he is actually part of a light environment and that means we are bringing in some of this light everywhere just like this on the horn all the way around on the horn so the horn is an example of your lack of form studies because you outlined it so you need to make sure that you know what's the base geometry for for the horn it's a cylinder and that's something that you study in, in a form study environment. That's something that you perfect in a form study. Okay, I mean, this part of the head is probably casting a shadow on the horn just like that. It's okay, I'm gonna just cut the head off this way. 
just like that. And then I'm going to continue to desaturate, adjusting as I go. And I would start correcting kind of what you did here along the cheekbone. Both cheekbones aren't equally exposed to the light source. Seems like the light source is traveling on the half, just the top, and then we have is not traveling on the half, sorry. So you have a lot of lines left. You have a lot of these really, really strong um, just outlines around everything. So around the tusks, around the nose. And that's kind of causing some trouble in the believability of this character. It's, it's already such a you know, fantasy character. For you to use lines, you're already throwing off so much. And then I'm going to use less of that strong cheekbone. This is probably going to make him look really ugly. There you go. But uh, again, this is your choice. I would I would go into liquify and kind of just figure out what I can do with it. I don't want it that strong a cheekbone because we already have these tusks and these horns and these tusks. So I would try to make that cheekbone a little bit more mild. And that way we can explain why we don't have as much shadow on this side. So it makes sense to throw all of this light around the, the brow bones, but the brow bones are responding to a nearby light somewhere. So that's what we have to start doing. So we have to get these, all of these objects, all of these elevations to respond to the same light source nearby. Okay. It probably has some more indentations moving up along the face. The eye here is just too visible. Try to make both eyes look the same. And the scar just seems a little bit like, you know, it's not really scary anymore. And for the scar to really feel very scar-like and scary. You're gonna have to just widen it a little bit because it's starting to look like a line. So you're gonna have to just show, you know, where the scar tissue eventually healed along his eye and probably gray out this eye because it probably damaged his eye as well. So you gotta, you know, go in there. And part of the scar is gonna be in shadow and part is going to be in light because it's an indentation. Do you see how that effect looks really good? Same thing over here. Just to have to decide where the light source is coming from. And then you can do that. This part goes back in to the brow bone. And this part goes into the cheek. And this goes into the eyelid. And then I'm going to just completely gray this one out as if he, you know, got damage there. And his eyeball is just as much a sphere and a geometric object as anything else in the composition so it gets shadows as well and it gets highlights and it gets some of the background value. Not too much of course. And then the main cast shadow. <laughs> Lipstick. Okay, so we're slowly building up and building up on these layers of, you know, really good choices that we're making with the, with the design, with the, you know, colors, and we're, we're adding it up. It's going to all add up, but you have to make sure that you're never at any point depending on a line, because as soon as you say, hey, line, you have a role to play in this drawing, you will not explore the form enough with your brush stroke you will say, okay, this part is rendered, let me move on to the next. And then you finish the painting and you're like, hey, why does this painting look bad? And that's because you weren't giving the form a chance. You weren't breaking things down to their core geometry or you weren't. I don't recommend using a soft brush, by the way, on an ogre, but I have to kind of hurry up. So right now what I'm doing is I'm kind of just outlining. And I'm gonna get into these uh, tusks in a second. You have to give the tusks their own layer uh, or just paint them at the end because what's happening is they are reading as kind of mushed together with the rest of the face. And I want them to read as if they are uh, kind of there, you know, in front of everything. So we have a middle ground, foreground, background kind of deal. 
right, right here, right at the top of the nose, the nose catches the most light. So it's going to just get its kind of little domain over here, just like that. And it's going to just catch some light because it's kind of in front of everything as well. So you're going to have to think about overlapping, and that's a big one. And again, that's something we explore in form studies. And then this area here of the nose, trying to give the nose a little bit more volume. I'm not sure why you have this white here on the nose. I'm not sure what that's doing there. All you need for a nose, and this is it. This is, this is as I talk about in the nose video. This uh, Geometry of the nose isn't rocket science. It's only a couple rules, you guys. So you need the sharp edge, and you need the radial value climbing inward. So this way we can get the black and just radial, radi radially climb that value upward so it actually reads as a cavity. Not all at once, of course. Radial values mean that we're working from a small brush to a large brush. Now I'm just going to move in anywhere else where we have these black pockets, and I'm just going to start bringing in some of these radial values. Kind of starting to look like my dad. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm going in here. Sometimes we have a bit of extra anatomy around the nostrils. So that's a big one. <clears throat> right over here. Depending on where the other nostril is, sometimes we'll just end up getting this, um, <laughs> this overlap just like that uh, just depending on where the other nostril is so what I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to leave it like that and then throw a sm slight <laughs> your dad is scary oh you have no I have fucking idea man you don't even know homie all right so just like that I'm going to start outlining around the nose just a little bit and this is my also my work process this is my workflow this is how I kind of figure things out. I start with a crazy sketch and that's where I get to explore big sizes and asymmetrical faces and whether or not I'm keeping and you know allowing the nose to droop or and it's going to look very different from the before and after but it's a good way to represent exactly how much you're supposed to be doing. And you can see there's so much design power in um sorry liquify is going to poop itself. Okay, relax. God. Okay. So there's a lot of design power in the features, um, of course, duh, but they, they come with specific narratives. So the big nose is the silly one, the dumb one. The floppy ears is the dumb ogre. Um, and you can see this in the three ogres designed in the Lord of the Rings, I mean the, the Hobbit movie. You can see this is exactly what they went through. The, the dumb one was the silliest one with all of the dumb features. So the big, you know, wobbly head, the silly nose, the floppy ears, the droopy nose, I meant, and uh, the downturned eyes. But the scary one, the ugly one, um, the one that is the most threatening, the intimidating one had all of its, you know, sharp eyes. And so this is more scary. Doesn't it look more scary? Uh, than ones with droopy eyes. The droopy eyes are very, very unthreatening and very friendly looking. Or you can have both, and he just looks ugly for the sake of ugly. So he looks like a very, very ugly, mean guy and a little bit of both. And then we have, you know, an uneven jaw. Maybe his jaw got, got uh, you know, damaged. Or maybe this eye is droopy because it got a scar on it. So there's a lot of design power in all of these features, what you're doing with them. And symmetry is something you throw out the window when you're dealing and designing these characters, when you're dealing with these characters. As for the type of green, I think the type of green is just very wrong. Um, I'm going to raise the values up one more time. Actually, no, I'm going to leave the values alone. I'm just going to adjust the, uh, the, the skin color and the saturation. So it was a little bit, so the thing is it's a little bit too dark. I do have to lighten stuff up just a touch. And then I will get the old layer and erase back all of these uh, dark spots. So I'll just find all the dark spots and just get them back. And that's really all we need. We just need some of the dark spots. This dark area here can be just a little bit darker. We have another dark spot right here under his, under his chin. So we've got 
an edge now, and we've got another piece of uh, object overlapping and uh, um, overlapping the rest of the face. So we, oops, select inverse. There we go. So we've got the chin in front of the pocket of the neck, which does is is basically a radial value. It's basically like one object in front of another. You see how much interest, how much more interesting this object is now. This character is. And so I'm going to start outlining the tusks to make them look a little more scary, more sharp. Starting to look a little soft, and that's just because of the soft brush I used. I do recommend like really, really rough brush strokes. If you do have to clean them up eventually, but don't clean them up in such a way where as you. Um, uh, get rid of all the edges. You want to preserve as many edges as possible. God damn it. Okay. Actually, I'm just going to leave this on for the love of Pete. I need to give this um, task more edge because it's in front of the rest of the face, but it has shadow, so it's got a dark side to it. And I'll grayscale it. But do you see what I mean by everything's too soft? Because I just did this with a soft brush. Don't do that with a soft brush. Don't do that. Um, you want to go in there and fix the edge with some, you know, an edge brush or a hard edge brush. And then it has reflective light because it's wet, so it's probably going to reflect nearby ambient light or something like that. Okay, there's much more left to, to work on with this character. I'm going to just quickly dodge tool around him just to bring in some contrast. Contrast helps finish a painting, but it's not the only way to finish a painting. Edge work and using edges and making sure that you're uh, cleaning up and overlapping where you have to. All of the kinds of edges have been addressed. All of the kind of, um, you know, like small brush use has been balanced along the focal point, all of that stuff is considered. And that's pretty much how you render. But, but contrast is definitely one wonderful way to bring in some completion or a feeling of completion to the painting. But please don't depend on it as the only way. It is not the only way to complete a painting. A lot of you just go straight for the black and white and it makes zero sense. Um, this area here is just white for no reason. It's kind of outside the temple. All right. So you see how before he was a touch too dark and none, nothing was really showing up. Um, as for his shirt, I just don't, I don't recommend a shirt right now. I don't recommend you even thinking about how to dress him up. Um, just focus on the character design, some of the basic anatomy around his body, um, what, what kind of other stuff is happening around his face. So now that we've cleaned up the whole plate, I would go in and kind of figure out what we're doing with his eyes exactly. His eyes got distorted a little bit, and that's fine. See how threatening this looks like that. You want to make his character feel more of like a, like a piercing gaze. You have to give him like this, this kind of eye. But of course, make sure that the face and the eye is perfectly spherical. You've got all of the eyelids where they belong. I'm sure he closes his eyes sometimes. Or you can just make it all blue and all scary as well. That just looks just as scary. Careful of the outline and look like makeup, but also that's a really great way to make a character look scary. If you guys look back um, to our uh, villain challenge, we place a lot of black around the eyes to make the character look scary. See how like automatically ugly he looks because of that? And that's just that whole Skeletor face. If you want to use that, you can use it. If the commissioner likes it, if the person you're designing for likes it, you guys can use this as well. Just that dark circle. But remember, don't depend too much on makeup. This is just as scary as well. This is just as freaky. Halloween. <laughs> when we were kids, we were ESL. So this is a funny story. So what we used to, I'm just giving him some eye bags here as well. So we used to think that the word Halloween was scary. That that was like the scary word. 
And so that's what we would kind of say to each other. And because we were a bunch of just fob ESL kids, <laughs> me and my siblings, we would, you know, at the word, at the, at the, just the sound of the word of Halloween, we'd start crying. Because we just thought it was, you know, associated with evil monsters and kids getting kidnapped and shit. So every time I hear the word Halloween, I'm just like, remember that shit. It's so funny. Yeah. So yes, I was ESL. I do not know all the English. So have mercy when I say something wrong. <clears throat> <laughs> Poopy Lord says that he'd still smash. Okay. Sure you would. All right, so I'm just going to do a couple more funny little edges here. Try to get the uh, get the reed going. And the reed, when I mean the reed, I, 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 when I say the reed, I mean um, ESL means English as a second language, sorry. <laughs> when we didn't know any English, yeah. But I, what I mean by read is the more edges we have. The more edges we have, the more we can differ differentiate between one feature and the other. Let's see, now I get to really mess around with radial values climbing into a small brush because I graduated into the small brush. What are the three ways to detail again, if we can quickly recap? Right, so now my small brush gets to shine because I did two things already. I cleaned them up and I took care of them. I'm going to give him a nice big puffy eye right over here as if he got punched recently. <clears throat> In Russia, orc smash you. <laughs> yes, I, I live in the U.S. I grew up in Canada. I'm from Iraq, and I am just an international woman. All right, so doing that whole detail thing really, really. Look how pissed off he looks. It looks like he just got no sleep, right? Gonna give him that little wrinkle here. My brush is very small. Am I allowed to do this? Edges, contrast, small brush details. Excellent, excellent, Kira. And I am allowed to do this actually because I graduated into it. The first and most important way to detail, which is part of the read as I mentioned earlier, is the edge work. Making sure your edge is nice and sharp where it needs to be. And then there is contrast so making sure you have blacks and whites where they're supposed to be and I leave small brush work to the very end because you guys you guys lose control you're like the energizer bunny or that one squirrel from over the hedge you guys go crazy because as soon as I give you the green light to use small brushes you guys go in there and try to paint the whole thing with a single width single pixel width brush no work on your edges and we do this by exploring edges um, in their in their most most common denominator kind of form, which is a geometric anatomy. And we do that in form study. So I'm only able to know what I'm doing with my brush right now because I have this backdrop in my brain, in my visual library of form studies that I'm using to pull information from. So right now I know I have an issue with this brow bone because it's got no core shadow. So what I do is I grab the value and I give it a core shadow on the halfway mark, just like that. And now look how much more realistic that looks. But I'm also going to do it in such a way where it's an edge as well, because it's a sharp, not a perfectly round cylinder, but a sharp cylinder. And that sharp cylinder has to be reflected all the way out here as well on the edge work, on the silhouette, which is the contour line. Right? That's how you draw. This is how, this is the narrative in your brain when you're trying to paint something. This is the narrative in your brain. This is how you're supposed to be thinking. I'm going to bounce some light up there. I'm going to bounce some light up here. I'm going to show how he kind of has that saggy eye from that one attack, whatever attacked him. So now it's a real scar. It's an actual scar. It's not just a, a line. Okay? And that's what you did. You found a line version of everything and then you just got away with it and you thought the painting was nearly done. This is the difference between a good painting and a bad painting. I'm sorry, I have to be honest. Some of you think you can just settle for the line and that's it. And you wonder why your work is the way it is. Or some of you um, know you're supposed to do form studies. You've seen me talk about them. You've seen how they benefit other students. But you still do this, you know, this thing with your, with your lines and you still avoid doing the form study homework. The real, you know, they're really fun. 
Form studies are really fun. I'm going to bring in some more like lip wrinkles to wherever his, his teeth are kind of pressing into his gums or his mouth. Because it doesn't seem like his face is very balanced. He seems like he's just in constant pain. Right? And you wouldn't blame him for being so evil and pissed off. All those elves with their pretty faces and their perfectly aligned features and he's just stuck looking like this. I don't blame him. But I hope this guy visits every student who who, <laughs> who gets lazy with their form studies. I hope you see this guy in your dreams. Alright, a couple more little highlights and I'm allowed to shrink my brush wherever the light is reaching his face. That's where we're getting some highlights. And that's basically how you render. Large to small, edge work to, 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 to fine detail, looking up references where you need them, pulling from a beauty visual library that you know, you've grown aware of because of your like constant homework, constantly looking at different kinds of faces, coming to class, writing things down, writing notes down. So you can't say you don't have a class that's taken care of. You can't say no one is tell, giving you the right kind of homework that's taken care of. The rest is all you. It's just what you do. And if you want to be able to draw and render stuff, this is exactly what it means. This is, this is what goes on. Right? So the before and after obviously is going to look very different. It's a completely different kind of face. But if you were a commissioner, clearly you would go for the latter you would go for the after because it is more scary. It looks like an asshole. It's just, he just looks like a, a, you know, he looks like a jerk. So that's what we're going for. A character that feels real. And it feels real because we painted him real. We designed with real expressions. We pulled, we, 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 we pushed against the beauty standards and pulled from the ugly. That is the result of the opposite of the beauty standards. So how much creativity really did happen? Almost none. Because the rest, science took over. Science says, okay, hold my beer. <laughs> I'll take care of the rest. There's only so much really creativity is expected out of you at the end of the day. Once you've done sketching and you've made him look like a big mean jerk, you're pretty much just, you know, doing the sciences after that. Please keep the comments focused on the session. Thank you. All right, I'm doing one last little brush here. I'm probably going to work on his ear just really quickly because it's so sharp. It's demanding some attention. Um, so I'm just going to give it some attention. I'm not going to let it get that light because it's in a dark part of the face. So that means it gets a little dark, a dark part of the painting. I mean, dark part of the cube is the back off. All right, now I'm going to bring in one color, and this color that I'm bringing in is going to be the blush color, basically his skin color. But if orcs have black blood, or they don't really have red blood, or, or, or whatever it is that they have, we don't really give them that rosy cheek. Um, it's very, very stupid and silly to do that. Um, he, he's never going to have a rosy cheek. So colors you can bring in are just analogous colors, colors that are nearby. You can bring in a pale, gross, pukey color, like, uh, like yellow, like a dark yellow. All right, so let's see what this gross-ass color can do for us, which is exactly what we want. We want to use baby diarrhea yellow to kind of just boost this character along. Because we're not trying to make him look like uh, a cover girl, right? So this is a wonderful color to use all around the mid-tones. I'm bringing in some more of that. And he's pretty grayscaled, if you can see. So this is going to pop color right away. Right, another color, which is also a color nearby all this, is a blue, but a very ugly blue, something like, like this, something like anemic. And I'm just throwing that over anywhere where we have some color that's light. All right, and that's as much as you need. You're not going to bring in rosy purples and all these wonderful different kinds of colors to make him look, um, you know, whatever. You're not supposed to bring in these high saturations that sign signify children's book level happiness. He's an ogre and he's pissed off. 
and you want to make him look scary. And this is exactly what they did with the Lord of the Rings. I'm going to kind of give him a silhouette, um, kind of like subsurface scattering over here. So if you look at the Return of the King, the movie, and you see that standoff in front of, uh, where is it, Isengard, was it? Was that part two? Um, they they really look hideous. They, they look ugly. Yeah, it was, it was part two. It wasn't the standoff in front of, in front of uh, Mordor. It was, yeah, it was part two. Um, they just look so gross. So the exact scene uh, would probably be like the, the Battle of Ammon Hen, I guess they call it in the movie but it's just a whole battle sequence the closer they get the um and you can just see that the, the ogres look scary as all hell and they look deformed and that's really what those artists channel they channeled all the deformities that we know scientifically medically in this day and age we know of them and that's exactly what they cha channeled in, in order to make these ogres look hideous because now we have realism we have real ogres on screen we have to Tolkien can't just describe something to be scary. We have to see it. And then finally, I would kind of just darken the lower jaw because it's looking completely away from the, the screen, so I'm going to have to just darken it. The light, sorry. So I'm just darkening this lower half here. So I wanted to do this quick demo for you guys because I really haven't ever just talked about it through and through. Um, there are tiny little areas left here that are that need detail, so I'll probably detail around the nose, probably the most intriguing area. I would, if you want him to look a little bit more magical, I would kind of illuminate the eye just a little bit or give it some more saturation. Maybe you can saturate it to whatever color comes out with the sponge tool. I would just leave it there kind of looks more freaky um or maybe like make it a blue that would be a really really fun color to use i would probably desaturate around areas that are the beard so anywhere where we would have a beard i'll probably desaturate so it looks like he's got some kind of beard growing um but yeah that's it i hope this was helpful let's take a look at the before and after not that it's the same ogre anymore it is not uh, it is a completely different character, but it, I hope that it's kind of illustrated for you exactly what's required. The first change that I made was the background color, I believe. Um, that need that, that needed to be changed immediately. He looked very handsome. He looked like just a friendly guy or like my neighbor Tim who it dressed up for Halloween. Um, and you can go even more twisted with this guy. I mean, you could really make him look ugly, like kind of have that triangle um, gesture happening here. Let me lower that down, lower that. Something like that. Look how fun that is. That's fucking hella fun. All right, make his whole jaw just completely dislocated and sagging and he's always like, you know, drooling a little bit. But over here, this guy was just too friendly and you wanna go for an ogre, you're gonna have to completely break all the beauty standards, bring the eyes in closer together. Give me some wrinkles, like give me some ugly. Um, that's like, that's pretty much the only thing that's ever going to push, push, push that feeling of, of, uh, fear is that you will have comp all the units of beauty have been interrupted. All of them. All right, a couple more wrinkles here and there. And this is just to show you exactly how I kind of bring in the wrinkles just like that. Yeah, this is, this is a lot of work and it's just you know, it, it, it kind of tests your limit and your results probably going to be very different from mine. But the point is that you're trying to uh, break all, all your comfort zones. But sometimes we design characters that are supposed to be scary and we stay in our comfort zones. So you stayed in your beauty comfort zone. You probably thought you were making something look hideous, didn't you? But it really wasn't that effective yet. And to really push it and explore, that's when you become an amazing designer. That's when you become a designer that can push the exact feeling, the exact, you know, accurate feeling that the narrative was intending, which is a big, mean army general guy who is an ogre who eats babies. You know, you want to make him look like a dick. He just looks like a really friendly ogre that's part of a really friendly company of ogres who really, really enjoy their uh, escargot. Okay? <laughs> Um, so I hope that helps you 
any questions at all about this demo? So I, I do want to take questions for this so we can talk about different areas of the workflow. I'm sorry I'm a bit uh, scatterbrained today, but I'll try my best to focus. <clears throat> um, now turn this ogre into Trump. <laughs> Ooh, oh, he looks good purple. Oh my god. This guy looks great purple. All right, let me find the Trump color. He even looks good like this. There you go. <laughs> That's as close to Trump as I can get. Um, no, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, here, let me just raise the values up. I feel like he's a little washed out, but... No, I, I really, oh my gosh, I really like that blue. They look great, eh? Um, definitely learned a lot, though. Good. I didn't realize that before I had so many problems. If you do have any questions about this demo, please uh, write at Istabrak so that I can find your question. There's a lot of people in the chat right now. <coughs> um... Ogre is Trump. <laughs> you know, guys, this is this blue is so fun, isn't it? Yeah, they did look different, of course. Um, he went from Shrek to that scarred ogre from Return of the King. Yeah, the really melted looking one. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing the I'm watching someone peel a scab face. <laughs> Um, can you squiggle on a toupee really quick? <laughs> no. <laughs> Before elections? After elections. Guys, do you have any questions or are you just full of these things? I was going to be sitting here laughing the whole time. Um, Mr. Rock, please do a Lord of the Rings themed piece. Yep, baby diarrhea. That's the color we go to when we want to throw some color in to... Uh, to make him look a little bit more alive, but not necessarily bring in like a p baby pink or something like that. <clears throat> um, I'm just looking for these questions because there's so much to sift through. Um, poor guy, you ruined his face. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep him as green. Okay. What could we do if we wanted to draw a bad but awesome guy? So what do you mean by awesome? Is he hot? Is he very skilled? Is he, um, has he, is he just like pure evil and he's really good at being pure evil? Uh, you have, there are levels and those levels are guided by nothing but the narrative. Actually sitting down on your big fat butt and turning on words pad whatever it is <laughs> and writing okay actually writing the character out you're not gonna do writing all right everybody write this back to me you're not writing while you're drawing the drawing aspect happens after writing all right the drawing is when you have something to draw if you haven't written the character and you're trying to draw him it's gonna look really bad because the character is between two major ideas that you have that you really haven't, you know, married together and, and balanced. Your writing happens before drawing. Right? Drawing is not writing. Write that back to me. Isterback, what's the light on his large tooth? It doesn't go with the light source. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, these these two things right here. This, yeah, I would just, I would, I'm not done with this tooth. It's completely un under rendered. This whole portrait isn't finished. Um, but, uh, I might just fit, start painting it and critique our, I mean, in after hours later, but no, this tooth isn't done. I would probably give it a new shape, give it a new layer and just render it along this kind of light source right here. You're not writing while you're drawing. Exactly. So please don't think that you're kill, killing two birds with one shoe. If you're, if you're drawing something, um, and you just started it from scratch, the writing aspect happens before, after writing, we have sketches and planning, and in those sketches and planning, we explore breaking all the beauty standards, throwing off the symmetry, um, thinking about you know his past, and maybe he got punched in the jaw and scarred, and his eye threw him off, so his whole face sagged to one side because he broke a couple nerves or something. I don't know. Um, maybe he's just constantly looks like this. Maybe he has no eyelids. Maybe he was tortured. Maybe he lost his ear. 
This is all very, very sad. I'm getting very, very sad right now uh, for him. But I kind of just see a lot of myself in this ogre right now. Um, but yeah, just the writing happens before, and then you have sketches and preliminary planning, and then finally, way after, at the end, all the way at the end of the horizon, you can start drawing. You can start actually rendering the character. Would wrinkles in, for example, the forehead uh, just be cylinders in terms of shape? Yeah, exactly. So let me show you exactly how that looks. So we want to sketch them, of course, first. So I'm going to have a wrinkle here, a wrinkle here and then a wrinkle here. I don't want them all to be the same size. I'm going to throw another one here. All right, what does this mean? It means that this line here has represented an edge. So I get highlight, and then I get an eraser, and then just erase. Just take a look at what's happening here. And then I erase again. I do want to gradient, so I will probably re-gradient this. But this is this is this is all it is. And then we get another line. So I'm getting a new layer. Another line that I radially descend here. And then I'm just making cylinders stacked on cylinders. And then the areas that get blended are this part of the cylinder, which is on top of this cylinder. which is on top of this cylinder. Whoops. What's happening? All right, whatever. Which is on top of this cylinder. And this one gets a little blur. Which is on top of this cylinder. I have to make sure this one has a nice sharp edge to it. So this is why, you know, combination of uh, blocking in early and then, uh, sorry, and then blending later, <laughs> my brain just farted. This is why we want a combination, blocking in early and then blending later, because they do have cylinders at a later time. And then all you gotta do now is just blink it all in. So always zoom out, assess what you need, what you have left to do. So we've got one object on top of another object on top of another object, and they're all casting shadows as they go down. And then, of course, I did this all zoomed in. I have to adjust the degree of brightness everywhere. So I'm just going to darken this as I go. And some of these little, little swells here caught some light a little bit more than the rest. So I'm just catching some of them with the lasso tool. And just some are just a little bit more out than the rest were, and they just catch a little bit more light. Just like that. And that's how we would do these wrinkles. They're like full cylindrical shapes. So we have one cylinder stacked on top of the other. But that's typically all that it is. You're always going back to your geometry. You're always going back to the most basic shape. And that is shape. It's in everything. That shape is in everything. There's no shape that will sneak up on you if you do a good amount of cylinders, a good amount of spheres, Good amount of cubes and all that. How do you decide when there is too much contrast or when there is too little? So earlier I decided there was too much contrast and I lightened the piece and then erased only at the dark spots because instinctively, visually, I felt it was too dark. And at that point, that's when my critiques probably and my lessons get abstract because there's no one place I can direct you to, to see that you went too dark too soon. Um, maybe you have too much white and too much black. But that's the only real... A uh, way to really measure it if you have too much of this line, if you have too much of this line. But what if you have too much of this and this? These are still too light and too dark if used together. Um, so you, you still don't know. It's just sometimes it's, it's what you think looks wrong. Follow it. That's how we're doing it. We're not, we never paint consciously. We're painting unconsciously. We're painting like we are letting the brain do the driving and we're just sitting there in the passenger seat. We are not actively making every one of these choices. Sometimes we are if we think really hard and it's kind of getting difficult to render something. But the rest of it is all instinctive. It's, it's all instinct. Some of, some, sometimes that's how you know. Uh, how would one draw realistic drooling on that ogre? Um, you just get a grayscale value. Make sure that is see-through. Make sure you have a good 
uh, gravity representation on the drool and um, that you have high specularities and random areas reflecting to the light um, because that is wet and the drool is wet. Um, how do you add detail like freckles uh, with a brush? New layer, um, make sure it's low opacity and all the freckles aren't necessarily smudgy so you have to make that they do have edges to them um, and different colors and different sizes and make sure they're not equally spaced. <clears throat> um, when is after hours like right after critique no uh, after hours is random and sometimes I'm, I'm just doing my own thing sometimes I probably don't uh, uh, I, I won't like always have the same kind of drawing in my after hours it's more of a personal time for me to draw um, but uh, but it's very random but the way to get notifications on my after hours is to just go to my channel Give me a quick second, uh, my channel. And make sure that you have the bell on. Where is that? This is a new layout. Shit, I don't even know how to tell you guys how to do this. Um, I don't even know how to uh, show you. I, I don't know. I don't know where the new bell is. I don't know how. <laughs> Let's see if it's here. Mm, I, don't, I don't know. So go back to home. Sometimes when I'm live, I have a, a little live now section. So I'm live right now. You just have to go here. If you have, I don't know how to, I don't know where it is. There used to be a bell. You click on that bell, you get emails and all that kind of shit about when I go live. So if you have that, you'll be notified of when I go live. But um, if you don't have it or you're curious as to how to get into the critique hour once it's announced as an event or live stream after hours once it's just go once once it goes live it's just usually in this little section right under the brushes and stuff um also over here i, re I really don't know where the little thingy majiggy is so that i could tell it so god damn it god damn it youtube <clears throat> vr googles and tape my island <laughs> Um, it doesn't look right when I do that though. Uh, da, 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 opacity. It's a wreck. How can you make an object seem see through? Uh, though, uh, you can paint it in full, Daniel. Paint it full opacity and then lower the opacity of the layer. You can paint with the colors underneath. So combine the color of this water with the color underneath it that it's letting through. Uh, but usually, what I do is I just do the layer thing. It's much much more easy. I have it on your page. You can't see it because it's your own channel. Oh, okay. So, okay, go to my channel and then click the little, um, the little uh, bell. That If you have that on, you will be notified when I go live. But anyway, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. If you want to stay connected to our channel, um, just go to istabrak.com and click on the little Google Plus icon. And join the community and upload your work. Thank you everyone for watching. Have a great day, guys. Um, I will see you guys on Thursday. I hope to, I hope I can start seeing some of those sketches in there. And um, remember, it's Halloween theme, so you can just go crazy. Um, but yeah, bye, guys.